Thank you all for returning uh, to your seat. So our aim is not to have you sit for long periods of time, but we'll do three to four talks. We'll have a break. We'll come back. And that way, um, we've all sat through meetings that were far too long with uh, sessions that were too long. So our goal, uh, lots of shorter presentations. So let's, let's get uh, on with our next. Um, next, we have uh, Caden Dooner. He'll be presenting. Uh, he, Caden is... Again, one of the Wolfpack students. He's also an undergraduate at the University of Central Florida. Caden and Owen and some of the other students that are here are actually part of a subgroup of our Wolfpack called the Amaris uh, CubeSat-based Lunar Rover Team. So they are actually at several universities and Caden's gonna be sharing uh, that project and that program with you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Caden Dooner. Good evening, every, good morning, actually. It's not even evening yet. Uh, my name is Caden Dooner. For those of you, you can see my slide up there. I'm sure you've also seen the one slide pop up many times uh, in between every other slide. So um, anyway, my name again is Caden Dooner. I am an undergraduate student at the University of Central Florida, majoring in aerospace engineering. Uh, as you can see, I'm gonna be talking to you guys about uh, one of our projects that we've been working on called the Amaris Lunar Rover. Uh, this is a 1U sized uh, CubeSat-based rover, and by CubeSat-based, I mean we're going to be using a lot of CubeSat technologies in that rover since the Wolfpack and a lot of the uh, students that we have on our team have a lot of experience with uh, CubeSats. So before I really get into what Amaris is, what we want to do, and what we have done, I want to talk to you a little bit about our team. So recently we have acquired a lot of fantastic undergraduate students. You can see we have a lot of schools up there, and some of them aren't even in the United States. We have a lot of people, uh, we have a couple people from Germany, uh, the UK, even out of Florida. Uh, I know Max is here and Owen's here with for UF. Um, Max right there as well uh, at, at uh, Worcester Polytechnic. So we have a lot of great uh, university students on our team now, but um, we also have the Wolfpack students, which I'm sure you all know uh, very much about. Uh, I used to be a part of them. Uh, a lot of us used to be a part of them too. They are the middle high school students that somehow managed to work on these CubeSats and send them up to space. Uh, so they have experience and so we are from that. So we want to really start working on projects outside of just CubeSats, which is why we are starting to build this rover. And what we are doing now with this rover is our, our main goal anyway, is uh, experimenting with lunar dust. And this is the slide that you keep seeing. So. Um, what is the problem with lunar dust that we have? So we've known about lunar dust for a long time now, since the Apollo missions. And you can see that I have a picture of uh, Apollo Commander Gene Cern in there. He seems to be covered in dust. And yes, that is the lunar dust particles on the lunar surface. Um, it's logged in their mission statements that uh, they had a lot of difficulty operating due to this dust. Uh, it would clog up, you can see it's on his suit and it's covered in it. Um, it would clog up their machines, and they had difficulty operating with everything there, including the rovers and whatever equipment they were using. Uh, what we do know about this dust is that it is extremely fine and sharp, so getting it on you, it can tear suits pretty easily. It can just stick together to everything, so we want to mitigate that dust away. Um, and we also don't want it anywhere on us because it, it is also extremely highly toxic. Uh, one important feature about this dust, however, is that once it's exposed to UV and background radiation, it becomes photoelectrically charged. And this is what uh, many people know about it. So in theory, we can use electric fields to mitigate all this dust off of the rover. And that's essentially what Amaris wants to do. We want to mitigate this dust using electric fields. And initially, we're also gonna look at magnetic fields being used, but we're starting to look at electric fields as we, we believe it's gonna be more uh, easy, a lot easier and better for this. Uh, so I'll go to the next slide here. So we did a lot of background testing. This project has been in development for a little bit of time and we're now just getting into all the dirty work of it and we're just really starting to hit the road running with it. But we did initial testings um, a couple years back. Uh, you can see we didn't have a lot of uh, very nice materials to work with, but uh, instead of um, just being in universities, we, we took what we had and we created um, our lunar dust box, which is supposed to be a lunar environment we're supposed to pull the vacuum in there, kind of simulate a vacuum chamber um, made out of Lexan sheets. 
The idea was to take this uh, regolith here that you can see, Exoth uh, LHS1, which we actually got from UCF's lab, um, the Winter Highland Simulant 1. Uh, we took that and we tried to ionize that through methods of tribal charging and just various other methods, which I'll get into very shortly. Um, we also looked at electric and magnetic fields. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted to take this regolith, put it in the box, create a vacuum, and that would essentially be our space-like environment where we could test and see if we could mitigate anything off of the solar panel, which acted as our uh, lunar rover. Um, but unfortunately, this experiment was inconclusive. We, we had some data we could get. We tested the electric field strength through the indium tin oxide plates, which we ran a power supply through, one positive uh, through one side and one negative charge through the other ITO plate. And we tried to create the electric field in the middle. And we did test that. We did find that there was a 2% drop off, not much at all. So the electric field is definitely there. And that wasn't the problem with our experiment. Um, not that there was a problem, but uh, we just needed better methods to uh, really mitigate this dust away and ionize it and tribocharge it. Um, so again, we did try tribocharging it, which is the method of pouring it through uh, high quality plastics. We use the ABS plastics, um, pouring the dust through, trying to ionize that and repel that off the dust with the electric field. Um, we did not see any noticeable charge difference with this process, um, and this was just the initial ones. But we do want to come back to looking at methods of tribocharging now that we have a couple of access to shake chambers, maybe, and we want to just try some other methods, which I'll also get into a little bit later. Um, but we continued this experimentation process. Uh, this time, instead of just tribocharging it and uh, trying to apply the electric field from there, we used a Van de Graaff generator to uh, try to ionate, ionize this uh, regolith. Um, so we tested the ionized dust with the ITO plates, again, positive uh, through one side and trying to like push it off. Um, as you can see, we have the little makeshift stand there, the Van de Graaff generator underneath um, the dust in the plastic, and we tried to pull that there, try to ionize it. And what we did find was that we could get the dust to bounce off of each other, therefore it was uh, most likely ionized, um, but we got that dust to bounce away from each other. Unfortunately, we could not get it to bounce away from the uh, positively side uh, uh, ITO plates, uh, which is very unfortunate. But we do want to still look at uh, ways of using the Van de Graaff generator in case this may work in future experiments. So it wasn't inclusive for now, but we do plan on uh, getting back in there, especially now our team is looking at a lot more experimentation ideas and we really wanna like get that going within this year and so that we can really get on the process of designing and building our rover, which is what uh, I will get into now. Here's the future experiments. Uh, as you can see, we wanna repeat these, get some uh, revised methods and equipment going Van Graaff generator and the methods of tribal charging, some of the ways we might want to do this. And we are going to be looking at more ideas and looking at more research purposes now. Um, but more importantly, we want to get to the next steps, which is really getting this rover uh, design. And you can see we have some models there. Thank you to uh, Max actually for these designs there. Uh, you can see that it is very small. It's a one U sized. Uh, we might want to expand this out to a two U, but for deployment purposes, um, we want it to be as small as possible. Um, fit it in the uh, any lander we were looking at Peregrine, um, but we want to um, try to fly that up as small as possible and expand out the wheels so that we we have this little idea of like a spring lock with the wheels and it pops out so that we can easily move across the lunar surface in case of any bumps or whatever there may be. Um, so we have a lot of great ideas. The thing is, we want to start looking for materials. Uh, this is a CubeSat based rover. We have a lot of experience with. Uh, CubeSats. So we want to take those technologies and incorporate them into uh, this rover design. So it looks very similar to the CubeSat, but it is going to land on the Walker's Mortis point of the moon and uh, traverse from there. So for the future, we definitely want to look at more tests. They were inconclusive. Um, and once we get these tests done, once we get uh, the dust mitigated from these plates, we can move on to uh, actually constructing it, which we are still working on now. And we definitely want to uh, set to construct by the end of this year, maybe going into next year as well. Um, and we definitely want to get ready to build, test, design, and launch this uh, very soon. It would be wonderful with our great team. Uh, so I want to thank you all for listening again. Uh, Mr. Sims, I very much appreciate this opportunity. I was trying to get it because I know we're a little bit behind, so I try to pass it fast. But if you ever have any questions, uh, Owen is here. I'm here. Uh, we also have our teammate Max here, and we're all Definitely here to um, answer questions. 
if you're also interested for the um, undergraduate students or even CubeSat development team students interested in joining this team, we would love to have you. Uh, we have big roles that you guys can fill. So thank you all for your time, and uh, I'll pass this on to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Caden. So I want to change our schedule just a little bit to help us get on track this morning. Um, we're going to knock out um, Wolfpack, University of Tennessee Research Foundation, and Caius with Alba Orbital. Then we'll take our break where we'll ask the university students to position themselves in the exhibit hall. And I want the pre-college kids to have a chance to network with all the college students that are here. So. So I'm vaguely familiar with the next group, uh, the Wolfpack CubeSat development team. They are truly uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of, of the work that the students do. And um, I think my job and us, uh, we educators, our job is to get opportunities for students that will do the work. So I have been very privileged to have more than 100 students over the years that really seem to enjoy this, and you're seeing them today. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Yasmin, Dylan, Daniel, and Harriet, who will now, now share about the Wolfpack CubeSat development team. Good morning. My name is Yasmin Schauer, and I'm a sophomore undergraduate student at the Florida Atlantic University Harriet L. Wilkes Honors College. Today, I, along with Dylan Kiesling, Harriet Gu, and Daniel Portis Levy, will be presenting about our team, the Wolfpack CubeSat Development Team, or WCDT. The WCDT is a flagship program of the Aerospace and Innovation Academy, which the logo is up in the corner, and was co founded by Ms. Shauna Christensen and Mr. Kevin Simmons. The WCDT is a team of students between 11 and 19 years old, approximately, who design, build, test, and fly CubeSats. So far, we've had two proposals selected through the NASA CSLI program, and one which will be launching in the beginning of next year, um, the FlipSat one. So our first CubeSat that was launched was the YSAT one, was launched in December of 2018 and studied extreme of fall bacteria. The CapSat one, was launched just this past July and is studying capacitors as a potential replacement for lithium ion polymer batteries. And FlipSat will be our third and next mission to space and will be studying bit flips. In addition to the CubeSat work that the team does, we also have a focus on entrepreneurial and advocacy efforts. One of our current focuses is the WolfSat one. The WolfSat-1 will investigate the bacteria Idianella sickensis' ability to digest plastic in space. One of the unique qualities that this um, bacteria has is the ability to digest plastic, and it has the unique enzymatic pathways to do so. So we're hoping that by flying this bacteria, we'll be able to get a full understanding of how quickly bacteria can really digest this plastic on orbit. So plastic has become a really big issue, especially in the era of post-COVID, lots of takeout containers, single-use plastics, and such. And that's causing a lot of plastic waste being produced. And so we're hoping that this will be a solution for more sustainable, um, more sustainability efforts. This bacteria was discovered in 2016 in Japan. Um, and was found to be di digesting plastic. So currently our plans for the WolfSat one are to submit a proposal to the NASA CSLI program within the next couple of weeks. And we're also working on a sustainability challenge, which we'll be submitting next week. And now we'll be... So the Wolfpack CubeSet development team was created in 2015 as an after-school club with the purpose to send a Cube satellite to space in three years. So after learning from high-altitude air balloon missions, the team wrote a proposal to NASA's CubeSat launch initiative for a 1U Cube satellite. So the successfully built and launched this CubeSat on December. 
3rd, 2018. So this CubeSat was called YSAT-1, and it made history as one of the first Cube satellites to be built by middle school students in America. So on the hills of this success, um, we um, created a different proposal that we sent to NASA um, for CapSat-1, and it was accepted in 2019. So the purpose of the CapSat-1 mission was to test if capacitors would be a suitable replacement for lithium-ion batteries, which are currently used in CubeSats. So CapSat-1 was recently launched this summer aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Kennedy Space. Um, so both the uh, CapSat-1 and YSAT-1 mission learning and success throughout the Wolfpack. Another thing that our team is also very proud of is how we were able to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic. So when online learning became available, we were able to attend and present any more conferences than ever before. Um, so um, also uh, with the help of online learning and we were able to establish remote connections with teams from Nebraska and North Carolina. So through weekly Zoom meetings, we taught these teams how to write their own proposal to NASA's CubeSat launch initiative. And with our help, the Nebraska team successfully wrote their proposal to NASA and was accepted to build their first Cube satellite. So our team has continued to grow, and with the help of online learning, we have been able to spread and welcome new students from different parts of Florida and um, different parts of America. So during the Wolfpack meeting, students can engage in technical projects such as learning, researching, and also working on hands-on work. Um, and they, as part of this work, students then have the opportunity to write about their technical work at aerospace conferences. So this is characterized as techies and talkies. Students can work on technical projects and then they can present about those technical projects at um, aerospace conferences such as this. So this helps inspire students in all areas of STEM. And no matter what you are interested in STEM, you can find a place on our Wolfpack. So for example, some of our students are interested in art and they recently published a children's illustration book um, about rockets and how they land. Blue Sky Learning Philosophy, which was developed by our funders, uh, Mr. Simmons and Ms. Christensen. So the Blue Sky Learning Philosophy states that you need a growth mindset in order to achieve a great result. So for example, um, when a challenging task such as a CubeSat, such as building a CubeSat, Blue Sky Learning Philosophy states that you must first visualize success and then break down that challenging task into smaller, more doable um, tasks. Um, the Blue Sky Learning philosophy says that um, we approach all our work with um, positive attitude, group work, leadership, and mentorship. So, for example, um, we mentor each other inside our wolf pack, and we're also encouraged um, to, at conferences, to network with industry professionals so you can give us ideas projects. So, um, at, at the wolf pack, we participate in many entrepreneurship competitions and events. Um, so, for example, on um, this year, we participated in the ISS NASA um, Sustainability Challenge, where we submitted our WolfSat-1 idea. So, Jasmine briefly talked about it, but it's to combat plastic pollution with the use of Idenalsa Kansas, which can digest plastic. So, we earned an honorable mention, um, we earned an, um, we, and, we were continue, and we were invited to continue researching further. Um, we to a other um, event um, called NASA iTech Challenge, and we were chosen among seven companies um, for the national pitch event. Um, we also participated in, in the Edison Awards where we uh, featured our founding company, Silver, which was second place in the educational category. So during the Edison Awards, some of us had the ability to participate in the Edison Youth Pitch event where we could, um, where we could talk to a panel of investors about any ideas we have. So this was a great learning experience, and we established a lot of mentorship opportunities that will definitely help us. And now here's Harriet to talk to you a little bit more about advocacy. Uh, then I'm Harriet Gu, here to talk to you about uh, Wolfpack. Um, in Wolfpack, we attend many events, such as Florida Space Day and Congressional Visit Day. Florida Space Day is basically an event where businesses in Florida will gather to have in an attempt to advocate uh, space legislation. Um, space Florida organizes Florida Space Day. However, Florida Space Day is mainly for the Floridian businesses, but Wolfpack is able to come to Florida Space Day because um, of Blue Cube. Congressional Visits Day is basically an event where uh, congressmen, women, and the WDCDT will gather to Washington, D.C. to try and advocate space policies. 
Um, while Wolfpack is visiting in Washington, D.C., they are also able to see how the legislative process works. And uh, however, we've been having the uh, CVD virtual for the last two years due to COVID. And currently, we are interested in making meaningful legislations. Um, in the Pleasant City Community Center, Mr. Simmons will meet with a group of children where they will in Wolfpack, we join competitions such as the engineer competition, as you can see, and um, where we've also published a children's book called Let's Go to Space about the ISS. In the shown images, you can see some of the Wolfpack members giving out handouts that to a couple of the children. Uh, to some. Simmons has also created a podcast where they interview some. Of the um, before someone is eligible to join Wolfpack, they must. Have Club. Space Club has two groups, uh, online and in person. Since we have uh, students from out of state, they, uh, the, the online group allows them to join Space Club. Um, in Space Club, uh, but they can Space Club members make mission patches, and they can also join competitions like we do in Wolfpack, like the Jeans in Space competition and all the other competitions that you can see on the screen. And we've also talked a bit about target rates last year, which I assume that the Space Club members are going to do again. Now, here's Daniel Porzlevi to talk to you about the conferences. Thank you, Harriet. The Wolfpack CubeSat development team frequently participates in international conferences in order to present our work. This year, we've had 37 of our 44 abstracts accepted into several conferences around the world. We had over 35 students present at conferences with 24 papers authored. The topics vary from biological payloads, to, which my colleagues mentioned earlier, to technology validation payloads and even space education. This year, we've attended several conferences, such as AIAA, or the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics SciTech Conference, the International Astronautical Congress, and the, and, uh, the Humans to Mars Summit. We, when COVID-19 hit, we were forced to go virtual, but now we're, 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 we've been able to return, and we're glad to be back. In the last year, Wolfpack students have participated in several aerospace, entrepreneurship, and education conferences and competitions, such as SmallSat, COSPAR, or the Committee on Space Research, and HICE, or the Hawaii International Conference on Education. I personally attended COSPAR earlier this year in Athens, Greece. I had a lot of fun presenting my work and meeting interesting people in the aerospace industry. I'm looking forward to my next chance to go to an aerospace conference. So what's planned? In the next year, the Wolfpack, is, the Wolfpack is planning to attend many aerospace conferences and participate in numerous advocacy events. We've already been accepted to AIAA's SciTech in Washington next January and the Space Ops Conference in Dubai next March. We will also be participating in advocacy and we'll even travel to DC if our teams advance far enough. Wolfpack students are also currently writing abstracts for, for several conferences such as the Humans 3 Mars in Washington, DC, and the International Astronautical Congress again in Baku, Azerbaijan. Now to my colleague, Jasmine, to wrap up the presentation. Daniel just mentioned there's many conferences in 2023 and beyond that we are already preparing for. We also want to increase access and opportunities for students to engage in HABs, CubeSats, and ThinSats, and make them more available to classrooms around the country. We're also looking to continue our outreach, advocacy, and entrepreneurship efforts to encourage as many students as possible to join the aerospace field. We're also planning to start and have recently started including many international students with maybe not some of the same space resources as we do to join us. We actually have um, a few new students in Europe at the moment who have recently joined the team. And basically, the, since the goal of the WCDT has been to design, build, test, and fly CubeSats, we want to make sure that we can encourage as many students to do this as possible. So to conclude, the WCDT will continue to foster passion for all things aerospace, encourage its members to find themselves in the STEM field, and prepare them for their future careers. Thank you.
Thank you, Wolfpack. Uh, next up, we have uh, a group from the University of Tennessee, is it Research Foundation? Re Research Institute, right? Um, these guys came highly recommended to me by Near Space Launch and Near Space Education, which means a lot to me. I'm, I'm very uh, pleased that they're here. I uh, want to make sure I have your right deck up. Apologies for the delay. Got any good jokes you can tell? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, highly recommend the near space launch. All right. So it's my privilege to introduce uh, the folks from uh, Tennessee, uh, Mr. Trevor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Adam Huller, and this is Tyler Sundstrom. We're graduate research assistants uh, from the University of Tennessee Space, group, or, uh, Space Institute. Uh, we work for the SEER Research Group on their project MicroStamps, which is a solution for nanosatellite propulsion. So nanosatellites are categorized as having a mass of 1 to 10 kilograms. Uh, we see this as an emerging technology that's really driving a lot of innovation in space right now, particularly in low Earth orbits. Um, we see a lot of applications for nanosatellites. A lot have been talked about today. Uh, we see some in swarms and constellations. One of the great things about uh, nanosatellites is that that small size uh, really reduces deployment costs. And also, you can put a large amount of nanosatellites in space at once, which means if one fails, it doesn't mean mission failure, which really reduces the economic risk of launching these things. And to date, over 2,000 of these have been uh, propulsion system on them. So why would this be? Uh, so if you want your uh, nanosatellite's mission life to last longer than the natural decay of that satellite, you're going to need a propulsion system on it to help maintain that orbit and stay and keep for it. Also, in terms of space debris, it's been talked about a little bit today. Uh, we all know it. We all know the well-known Kessler syndrome. Um, and so during that mission, uh, if you need to do a collision avoidance maneuver, a propulsion system is a great way to do it. Uh, and then also with new requirements coming out for uh, deorbiting within five years, uh, propulsion system is a great way to get that uh, satellite out of the sky once it's complete with the mission to keep uh, congestion down. Thrusters, however, are a leading candidate, and this is due to high thrust density, a high specific impulse, and then the ability to build these things small enough that they actually fit on a nano satellite. Uh, and that graph up there shows micropropulsion systems uh, plotted against their thrust and their uh, specific impulse, and you can see where electrospray sits on that spectrum. So our solution, the MicroStamp, uh, stands for Microscalable Thrusters for Adaptive Mission Profiles in Space. It's a UTRF uh, patent pending technology being built at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Electrospray device that uses ionic propellant, uh, or liquids as a propellant. It works on well-known principles of electrospray uh, devices. The electrospray chip consists of an array of open-ended, ultra-high aspect ratio microcapillaries formed inside a borosilicate cover slip by a Bessel beam laser, uh, or by Bessel beam laser micromachining. Each of those capillaries opens up to an ionic liquid reservoir on the upstream surface and opens to a single surface cavity on the downstream surface. That downstream surface of the chip is coated with an electri electrically conductive material functioning as an on-chip extraction grid. During operation, when an electric voltage is applied between the ionic liquid and the extraction grid, the downstream meniscus of the ionic liquid inside of each of those capillaries deforms into a Taylor cone and injects propellant to generate thrust. To attain useful levels of thrust on the order of at least a few micronewtons, arrays of hundreds of these emitters are fabricated onto a single chip thruster. Our target performance is tens of micronewtons of thrust with over 2,000 seconds of specific impulse with an onset voltage of 200 volts. All right, so what separates micro stamps from other electrospray thrusters out there? Uh, so that minimized onset voltage is a big piece. Typical electrospray thrusters require over a kilovolt of, uh, of um, voltage in order to work, which really cuts into that power budget uh, on that system. Um, the low onset voltage as well reduces um, any interference with the electric, um, electric systems on the uh, satellite. It also has a robust monolithic design. If you look over on the right side of that slide, 
typical designs have these fragile needles that stick out from the system, uh, whereas our capillaries are built down into the system. Uh, there's an ease of fabrication when it comes to making these things, and the design also eliminates a lot of common failure pathways. If you look on the right side of the screen again, back spray issues are a typical um, issue or failure pathway for these designs. Uh, and then mode switching eliminates the need for an ion beam neutralizer, which you see on a lot of electro spray devices uh, that also cuts into that power budget. And with that, I'll pass it over to Tyler to talk applications for microstamps. All righty, so uh, hello, I'm Tyler, also a master's student at the University of Tennessee Space Institute. Um, and basically, right now we're doing a study collaborating with Near Space Launch uh, as a part of a phase one uh, Space for STTR grant. And uh, basically it'll study the black box MCAT and, uh, in a, and integration of NSL's black box I-STAR with our microstamps thruster. Um, and so let's set the scene. Uh, this graph right here uh, demonstrates a natural decay for uh, one of the CubeSats um, that uh, they provided the mass for. Uh, and, it's, and this graph can tell you two things, all right? So the first thing it tells you is after your mission is complete, um, a simple drag decay is not going to work unless you have an extra option for it uh, within a five-year time span at those higher altitude parking orbits um, in LEO, of course. Um, and it also tells you during your mission, if you're parked uh, at a, one of the lower LEO orbits, you're definitely going to need some sort of thrust maneuvers to keep yourself in orbit if you want to have a mission of uh, at least five years. Um, and so that's exactly what we're, we're looking at. Um, so as of right now, the predicted thrust values of the, of the thrusters we're using is about 45 micronewtons per microstamps. And there's a, uh, we get a, we're, that value comes from um, approximating the um, thrust per capillary. So it's about uh, 40 nanonewtons uh, per capillary for, for ours, and that can be scaled up. Um, and it's got a specific impulse of 2,000 seconds. And uh, the dimensions we have on a 3U CubeSat right now, um, we're looking at four micro stamps on a 3U and eight on a 6U. Um, and we explored some rapid deorbit options, um, such a, uh, and we, we came up with a time-saving option and a power-saving option, whereas where the time-saving option is con uh, thrusts constantly until fully, de fully deorbited, and power-saving only thrusts in the sunlight. Um, and some current simulations that we're working on at the moment um, are, is a drag-free orbit and maybe uh, and other um, orbital maneuvers to maintain that orbit, uh, as well as some simple collision avoidance maneuvers based off of the International Space Station's uh, standard. And then from there, we're going to hone in those simulations and get some, some more, even more options for these thrusters. Uh, so let's talk about the data we have so far. Um, now, all this data was uh, super powerful. And uh, here's what we see on average. Uh, for a 3U CubeSat, uh, the power saving option, it takes 32% longer. Uh, than the time-saving option, but requires 51% less delta V um, from thrusting and consumes about 49% less propellant. And uh, with the time to deorbit uh, for the time-saving option, our uh, the longest we'll take is about 150 days, which is you know uh, far far uh, less than that uh, five-year cutoff. So uh, that's 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 excellent. And. Uh, onto a 6U CubeSat, we see a similar trend uh, where the power saving option takes about 25% longer uh, and about half as much delta V and propellant than the time saving option. Um, and now when we compile all this data together, we can kind of see how uh, the 3U and the 6U options compare together. And two interesting things I kind of want to point out here is that the 3U power saving option actually takes a little bit longer than the 6U power saving option. That's kind of cool because um, the 6U has a higher drag area when it's decaying. So in the, in the shadow, it's going to decay a little bit more. So that's pretty neat. Um, and the propellant mass, for example, um, we can see that the 6U power saving option is still half as much that of, uh, or it equals to uh, the same amount of mass that you would need for deorbiting a 3U uh, in the time-saving option. And just kind of just goes to show the different options that these stamps can provide. And, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, you could use these micro stamps for attitude control. Um, 
And some future things that we're going to do is we're working on designing a test stand to actually get some uh, more meaningful thrust values to apply and uh, design some more simulations for. Uh, we also would like to design an uh, additional propellant tank system uh, for rapid deorbiting because um, the reservoir uh, is, uh, w we just need to make it bigger for, uh, for rapid deorbit. Um, uh, for uh, avoiding collisions, um, we would also need a larger tank for as well as potential coplanar transfers, which opens up a whole new uh, potential for nanosatellites and CubeSats. So it's really, uh, really awesome. Um, but anyways, uh, in conclusion, as we, as we can see, you know, nanosatellite uh, uh, systems are on the rise, and, only, and because only 6% have had uh, propulsion systems, our, our, our uh, microstamps, hopefully we can, we can add to that um, uh, and have more nanosats actually come on board with uh, propulsion systems. So, um, so yeah, uh, basically uh, microstamps, um, like we mentioned, low offset voltage, it's very robust, easy, easily manufactured, and uh, be, due to their inset capillaries, um, it eliminates common failure pathways that you might see in traditional devices. Um, but anyways, yeah, uh, thank you very much for um, having us, and uh, thanks to NSL and... Uh, Real quick, too, we want to thank uh, Free Flyer AI Solutions. They're the ones that we use to uh, actually do a lot of these simulations. Uh, they're great for this small satellite uh, orbital mechanics stuff. Thank you. So we have one more session, uh, one more presenter uh, in this session. And uh, then we're going to do something uh, a little special at the end of this talk. If you're a student, a uh, pre-college student, we'd like to take a group photo of all the students that are here today that are not yet in college. So after this final presentation, if you would, if all the students would come up and let us just take a group photo, I would uh, really appreciate that. So, just before COVID, I had a group of about a dozen students at the SmallSat conference. We're staying in the dorm rooms, and every day we would send the students, Mr. Christensen and I would send the students out on their mission to network, build a CubeSat. They would come back to the dorms, and then they would present out what they had done that day. These guys hung around and seemed to be interested in what we were doing, and we sort of became friends with them. And this is the company Alba Orbital. So uh, probably the, the uh, person that traveled about the farthest to get here, I, I'm really glad he's here today. So today you're going to learn about uh, Alba Orbital and Pocket Cubes, and I'm really glad to have Mr. Caius Riza here. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Caius. Um, as Kevin said, I came over from Scotland, and thanks for inviting us. It's been lovely hearing all the talks today. A bit shorter, so I'll bring that down. <laughs> so yeah, I'm here to talk about pocket cubes um, and what they mean for like uh, space access, democratization, research, and education. So before we get there, um, I'll just tell you a bit about us and what we get up to. Um, so we are based in Glasgow, that's actually my hometown, and um, we were set up in 2012, I've been going for 12 years, uh, 10 years now, uh, and we've actually hold the records for the most pocket cubes launched, um, we've launched more than anyone else with uh, three orbital missions, two, one with SpaceX and uh, two with Rocket Lab, and another big milestone for us recently was um, we managed to get our seed round in after bootstrapping our first six satellites to orbit, um, completely without any sort of investment. And yeah, we do everything from the actual launches to you know helping people build their own satellites and doing conferences that we host. Um, so that picture there is from our most recent mission in May. And um, you can see the head of this little guy or his cousin that's in space, um, just up, uh, up on the photon spacecraft, I think. 
And yeah, I'll just tell you a bit more. Um, so we've grown to about a team of uh, 20 people now and we're still in the hiring binge. Um, and our mission we were founded was completely to democratize access. Um, so the way that we feel that you can democratize access is obviously to try and bring down the launch costs. And you know the way we felt you could do that was by miniaturizing the technology, leveraging Moore's law, leveraging all the R&D space, mobile phones and computers, just making spacecraft smaller. So a lot like CubeSats um, is what we do here, except they're like a eighth of the volume and they're only um, five by five centimeters. So this, this sort of concept was first proposed in 2009 by Robert Twiggs, um, we're working at Moorhead State University. And yeah, the first demo missions flew in 2013, which I'll talk on about a little bit later, including $50 sat, which is like a really influential mission. So again, yeah, this kind of goes more into the sizes and shows how we are moving on in terms of like technology and miniaturizing all of these spacecrafts. Um, and this is just a comparison of size. So a typical uh, 1P is only five centimeters, like I said, the name comes from, uh, they are small enough to fit in your pocket. So if, if you guys fancy passing this around, I'll just pass it down. Uh, yeah, so. And um, this is like uh, the very first private Brazilian satellite to ever launch this year. Um, and again, that really demonstrates how we are democratizing access to space because in Brazil, there was no private satellites. It was only those with like kind of space kind of institution, like really big government organizations who could do something like this. And that was a very educational mission. They've got lots of kits, which is originally meant as like an in-orbit demonstration mission for like ADS-B signals, but we've since moved on to Unicorn 2 platform. Um, which is a 3P, and yeah, that's um, more to do like Earth observation, and we can also, it's completely modular, so we can take on board student payloads too. So again, how are these tiny flights democratizing access to space? Well, like I mentioned, they are quite a little bit cheaper to launch, and um, they're only 25,000 euro, um, compared to what a CubeSat may be, sometimes it can be up to like $80,000. Um, all leverages components off the shelves, and there's lots of kits available. PocCube standards where people all agree on like certain specifics and what should be universally accepted in the build. And yeah, um, lots of open source designs. So this, this allows like smaller organizations access to space, allows for people to do larger satellite constellations, opening up new sort of applications there, and faster iteration and innovation cycles since you can actually afford to break some things and learn from it. And yeah, so I'll move on to $50 set. Um, so fifty dollars sat was like uh, one of the first Pocubes ever launched. It's a 1.5p, which is a bit bigger than a uh, 1p. Um, it was mainly just like a, a very simple mission just to prove that um, very low cost missions were, were available and to do. Um, so it is called fifty dollars sat, but it's a little bit misleading. It's closer to two hundred fifty dollars, still not breaking the bank. Um, but yeah, it was a very successful mission, which inspired a lot of people to go ahead and to try and do their own missions for education and commercialization and things like this. And to prove that PogCubes, you know, is completely a cost-effective opportunity for STEM students to try and develop real world skills. Um, so if you're interested in actually looking more into the standards to try and build something for yourself, uh, the current PogCube standards, um, it was released in 2018 with a, a kind of in collaboration with ourselves, T Delft and Gauss. And you can check out all the sort of mechanical requirements and the electrical standards as well with PQ60. Um, so some universities have worked with us, um, some are Florida based, not Florida based, um, US based, um, like Stanford, um, this is a completely open source model, um, Carnegie Mellon University, and the Tarsen Artebius, that's also an open source model, and TU Delft, who've got a lot of resources on their kind of websites, and yeah, they've all launched in our um, Transporter 3 mission earlier this year, alongside another 10 pocket cubes, but one of the most successful um, missions I'd really like to bring your attention to is Smog P. So this was um, the very first Hungarian Pico satellite um, launched um, from uh, Hungary. Um, and yeah, it was developed by the Budapest University of Technology and Economics University. Um, and we launched that as part of the first six Pico satellites I've ever launched. So you can see in the pod um, there, those first um, four out of the six. So its mission was completely to monitor um, 
it was a R spectrum analyzer that was to monitor electrosmog pollution from across the world, uh, which is like um, just uh, radiation emitted by electrical equipment. And it can interview a sheath around the world that can interview with radio signals. Um, and that can, you know, interrupt device communications, meaning companies will need to develop increasingly powerful tech, which consumes, uh, consumes large amounts of energy. And this is um, the amount of data they got. So I really put this mission here because um, when we were first coming over to the States, like back before we launched a lot of these guys that we talked to, all thought, okay, these satellites are tiny, are they just toys? But this really shows that it can be really useful data. Um, and it's not just that. Um, you can do it year on year, which is what this university have really gone through. And um, they've now boasted about three satellites in orbit and they're working on their fourth. Um, so here, this is a 3P that they're working on, and it's to, again, really push forward the sort of our spectrum monitoring mission, which they already did. Um, yeah, so that'll be launching with us in 2023. And again, if you're interested in the sort of RF spectrum kind of side of things, RF monitoring, um, there was a German satellite called REN, which was, um, was kind of, again, kind of monitoring ADSB payloads and ADSB signals uh, for plane tracking. And you could also try and do the sort of a ship tracking thing with AIS payloads. Oh, uh, no, my video's not working. <laughs> oh, it's just turned up. OK. Let's hope the volume isn't too low. OK. It doesn't look like it's working, so. So the point of the slide there was to really show that it's not just limited to universities, it's not just limited to startups, and um, high schools can do these sorts of missions too. Um, so I really like this example here. Um, this is um, the team that we worked with from Argentina. They came through from our first Pocky workshop in Glasgow, and their, uh, their sort of goal was to become the first um, Argentinian school to do a Pocky Cube and complete And they've done really, really great. Um, into a startup recently. Um, so after a second, they came to our workshop again and got really inspired by all the people they met and said, this is something we can do, let's do it. And then they went ahead and built a 2P satellite um, in which they've done the first launch this year and are doing a constellation of up to 100 of these satellites for um, IoT. So you can see this is like a sort of, that was a mission that was flown in SpaceX Transporter 3 um, into CubeSat 1. And they've, they're still going really strong on all the missions that they're launching. Um, but yeah, this is, again, another really popular use case for um, puck cubes and just getting devices communicating with each other. So again, these are two other university missions that became startups. Um, this was the first Turkish Pico satellite um, on the left. And they've now started the startup. And the one in the bottom left is, uh, bottom right, sorry, is a uh, from University of Malaysia, who again are really going quite hard on the sort of startup mentality. So yeah, the thing that's good about kind of pod cubes and IoT is the fact that you can get more revisit rates there since they're so low cost. You could launch quite a few, and the applications you know can you know help improve communications in uh, agriculture, smart cities, and uh, industry and infrastructure. And again. We've got some more high schools that we're working with as well. So this is um, the ROM team from Spain, not Spain, uh, Romania. And I'm actually visiting them next week. Um, they are launching a, Romania's very second PogCube ever. And some of these team members are as young as 15. Uh, so that's just a simple Earth observation mission. Um, and they're planning to do a constellation with like lots more subsequent launches booked. Um, but the thing there is just that it really shows how these teams can inspire lots of others to come around. And um, since they got announced in their sort of national news, another 25 high school teams in Romania, and they are part of a competition now. And um, so it's kind of become like a national STEM program out there. And this is our unicorn too, which is kind of shows you that they can be if you want them to be. It doesn't have to just necessarily be like in a low power missions. And um, this is something that we developed in collaboration with the uh, European Space Agency. And um, so on that, we've got the world's smallest and ADCS systems. It can boast up to 20 watts of power. And again, that's what all the sort of features are. So that was, again, first launched in 2019. And um, you can see myself with the team sporting an awful mustache. <laughs> and again, on the sort of new applications kind of aspect, 
what we raised the money for with um, Y Combinator was really to do like, um, since we can build a lot of these satellites a lot quicker and um, a lot cheaper than most other companies doing CubeSats, um, we are aiming to do um, a new real-time constellation as we'll be able to, again, have a lot more of these satellites in space, um, improving the revisit rates. So this has a lot of implications for like trying to um, detect wildfires a lot quicker and be like a really great first responder. Um, and we can also like tip and queue with um, CubeSats we've got higher resolutions. Um, it's just to sort of see, you know, be the first eyes on any sort of developing issue. And before we get there, of course, um, we're also tackling um, night lights, um, which is like uh, imaging the earth at night. So light pollution is something that a lot of people don't really think about. And it's something that a lot of the bigger companies don't want to focus on as much. Um, but as we are kind of small and responsive, we can really take this into our hands as no one else is really focusing on it. The only way you can get pictures from space at night and they sort of commercially is to try and go and um, get a contact an uh, astronaut uh, who's taking pictures in the ISS, which can be pricey and you know very quite difficult. And your availability is not great. Um, but with our satellites, we are going to have a much higher revisit rate and a much higher resolution as, again, what academics are using for, for studies just now is a VERS constellation from the really old weather satellites, which is like 750 meters per pixel, per pixel and we'll be around 24. So again, um, this is sort of the kind of research you can do. So, you know, these missions don't, the, the learning doesn't stop once they're in space. For me, I see it as like a beginning. Um, you can go on and develop your own startup and you know that has a lot of implications for like future workforces um, and again you can try and spin out your own niche of like how we're doing with the night lights and um, so for example the u.s government client that we're working with just now and um, they want to study artificial works and studying how the light pollution really affects wildlife ecosystem and how they can minimize its impact um mckenzie intelligence experiences and um, they want to measure the economic impact of war by seeing what sort of lights are on and off, because um, it can tell a lot about kind of the human settlements that are down on the ground. And again, trade and space are also, would like to try and identify kind of farm crops and broker ethical trade by noticing um, observing the ground. Um, so yeah, just to say, again, wrap it up. Um, Pockcubes are ideal for STEM education as shorter development cycles means you can launch them for under um, around 25,000 euro. And in under a year's time, you can do this as sort of a part of the curriculum. Um, lower costs, lower risk. So you can experiment with your iteration cycles and prototyping. And you can even promote further research on orbit. Encourages a lot of like uh, startups like we've seen. And again, there's been many masters and PhDs who have been supported on these sort of topics. So if you want to launch your own pocket, you feel free to get in touch. Um, we're happy to share some information. Um, these are the past few launches that we did. This was meant to be a video. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how well it's working. Um, so yeah. And again, we have um, the platform, ground stations, and the actual um, qualifications if you need help with this. And we are hosting our own conference in Glasgow later this year. Um, our sixth annual Pocket Developers Conference. So we'll have like a lot of talks from a lot of different use. A lot of people have been to space and done their own missions and learned from it. And it's a good chance to get, kind of see all these like um, the space hardware in person. It's actually a really, really busy week for us. And we're hosts, we're doing another launch. Integration for the fifth satellite. Uh, thing. Um, so it's a good opportunity to come see um, our offices as well if you're fancying a tour. So my name's Caius and Again, any questions, you can come meet me and uh, it was nice speaking to you all. All right, folks, I know that we have been excitedly awaiting lunch and so forth, which is coming soon. But before that, a few quick announcements about uh, what you can expect during the, the next few hours here. Kona Ice is here. They're only here for about another hour. So as you're starting to think about your lunch options, please consider very close to you here. If you head out towards the bathroom area, uh, which would be to my left here, go down that hallway and head out to the parking lot and make a little right. You'll see that the Kona Ice truck is there. If you're a teacher educator, when you checked in this 
morning and you had posted your information online, you probably received a little ticket that gave you the benefit of grabbing an ICE on us. But in addition to that, if you're an educator who signed in this morning, you received a ticket as well for our educators luncheon. That is going to be held in the Artemis room, which is down this hall here. We'll have, uh, of course, some distinguished educators speaking with you. And of course, we have a lunch that's provided for you as well. For the rest of you who are planning to head out to the park, um, just keep in mind, obviously, there's a tight schedule. But as you head out to the park and grab your food, uh, Kevin will give you some of that information about what time will start after that. The educators luncheon will begin at, you said, 1230. Is that correct? 1230. So we'll have a little bit of time uh, for that networking to take place as well. So if you have any questions, again, Kona Ice, out the doors to your right. And of course, other options at the park. All right, uh, two, two more uh, short administrative items. When we release, I would appreciate if all the university folks that are here today, the college and university folks, would gather in the exhibit hall with the exhibitors. I would like all the pre-college students that are here uh, from Michigan, Space Club, Wolfpack. Uh, if you're uh, not yet in college, we'd like to do a group photo under um, our banner, and then we'll release you to speak to the college students. And then after we do that photo, I want to show you this QR code that we'll leave up. We would appreciate if you would take, it's just four questions, but we would love your feedback so that we can make our conference even better next year. So at this time, uh, our sessions will resume. We have a great speaker from KSC. Uh, Mr. Nunez will be speaking to you beginning at 1.00. Oh, don't want to say the wrong time. 145. So at 145. So if exhibitors, college students next door, pre-college kids, let's do a group photo. And we look forward to seeing you after lunch. <laughs>